Hello. Yes. And welcome to a technically funny night. We have a great program for you this evening. In our science talk show, we'll be uh, talking with Vanessa Hodgkinson about her, her life and career, both in and out of science. She worked on solar energy and optimizing the efficiency of collecting electrons. It'll be a fascinating discussion. And then afterwards, we're really proud to have the graduates of the comedy school, Find Your Funny, performing for us tonight. Are you guys excited? Excellent. Let's get started with the comedy or with the science talk show for the evening. With that, I'd like to welcome my co-host for the evening, Miss Hannah Becker. Welcome, Hannah. How are you feeling tonight? I'm feeling great. Just hit my knee on the table. Fantastic. <laughs> but I'm ready to go. That's the kind of information everybody needs to know. So welcome to a technically funny science talk show. Uh, tonight we'll be discussing solar energy with uh, Vanessa Hodgkinson's. But as, as a reminder, this program is recorded uh, for broadcast on the radio and podcast to millions of listeners worldwide. At right? least. And for our listeners at home, this is being recorded live in front of a studio audience of roughly 300,000 people. <laughs> that is correct. Everybody's lovely t this evening, and we are joined, of course, by the esteemed Professor Einstein. Yeah, hey. What's up, Einstein? He doesn't talk much. That's all right. He's a, he's a ghost, so I mean. Yeah. Ooh. Spooky. Ooh. All right. That's how ghosts talk, right? Got Ooh. any shows to plug this week? Um, yes, actually. Tomorrow, tomorrow night... Uh, is in Spanish a comedy show which with a bunch of the English performers um, hosted by Xavi Castells, who's one of the professors of the students who are performing later. Um, and yeah, this should be a good show. It's tomorrow night at 9 o'clock in the Centro Civic de Barro de Vive, which is the red line. Take the red line basically to the end towards Fondo. <laughs> and it's there. But it's going to be really fun if you want to hear some comedy in Spanish. I'll be in it. Woo! Yeah! Yes. We all want to hear comedy in Spanish. Yeah, we do. That's it. And then Burn It Down is this weekend, right? That's on right. On Sunday. The excellent open mic at Burn It Down. Uh, Sunday's 23 Guitars in Poblasek. Yes. 8 o'clock? Yes. Correct. Best open mic in town. Oh, wait, no. Other than maybe Matt's new open mic. No, no. Burn It Down is, in <laughs> fact, the best open mic. But that, that does remind me, I'm starting a comedy open mic on Mondays here at Cosmo Bar, Mondays at 9 p.m., every Monday. It's for comedians, that, aspiring comedians that want to get into the scene, and then also for established comedians to practice new material. It's called Comedy Bomb Shelter. It's meant Here. to protect you from bombing. Yeah. <laughs> get it? Comedians find it hilarious. I don't know. That's all right. Just out of curiosity, how many researchers do we have in the audience tonight? All right, a Ooh. resounding 200,000 at least. Well, good. So, as you all know, the science talk show, we begin with uh, the headline news in science, and then we'll discuss uh, Vanessa's work. So with that, let's begin our comedy news in science. Let's do it. That's a great jingle. Excellent. So um, I read a story this week in the New York Times that was talking about uh, gut microbes, which are the bacteria in your tummy that help you digest food, um, and how maybe having good gut microbes can make you sexy. I think. I skimmed the article, <laughs> to be honest. I like don't care that much. Um, Anna is not a researcher. I'm not a scientist. Um, and so it seems like it's possible that uh, you can actually be attracted to the physical attributes that come from your gut microbes and not just like someone like not just physical attributes that come from nowhere. So maybe um, you're attracted to someone because they have good tummy bacteria and not like because they smell nice or whatever. I don't know. Um, you really have to look at what's on the inside of a person, right? Exactly. Um, so the, in the study, they gave mice good microbes somehow, um, probably with poop, right? <laughs> with <laughs> no, they fed poop? them yogurt. Or the active uh, bacteria in yogurt, lactis bacterius. Yeah. 
So they gave them good microbes, and the ones that had the good microbes, they grew like beautiful fur, and their balls got enormous, and they were just so happy, they're parading around their balls. And the female mice who, who got the good microbes were, were better mothers. They were more caring to their pups, which is apparently what you call baby mice. I didn't yeah, know. they're pups. Pups. Um, so the, my takeaway from this is that even gut microbes can be sexist. <laughs> Uh, yeah. My opinion, though, was that the article was shit. Just, yeah, actually, and it was really disappointing because this is from the New York Times, and I expected a higher level of scientific reporting. But they failed to mention, uh, they only cited one scientific article, and it was a PLOS One paper, which, let's not shit on any journals, but it's not the strongest uh, evidence. Yeah, but I don't know. I think that there's some important findings that, that we should discuss, right? Like that eating healthy can maybe make your balls bigger. And I think that that's the best way to start a new diet craze for insecure white men. I don't agree. I think my balls are large enough. Thank you. Maybe compared to the rest of the penis. Hey. Not that I've seen it. For what it's worth, all right? That study, so I actually brought, put some of the data from the, the actual study that this article was talking about on the right, and they do not mention testicle size once, all right? And so I don't believe it. But no, and, and a little bit more seriously, though, they only used five to 10 mice per group, so I think that the sample sizes are probably way too small to, um, mm -hmm. to actually believe in these results. And so I don't really believe that microbiota play a big part in whether or not somebody's attractive. Yeah, but, but Matt, think of the implications, right? You can start saying things like, it's not you, it's your gut bacteria. <laughs> or it was love at first bowel movement. <laughs> Maybe for you. You're such a romantic, <laughs> Hannah. Love some poop, you know? <laughs> Just keep going. Sounds like shit to me. I don't know. Hey. All right. No, but it is true, though, um, we're living in a time where more and more people are beginning to appreciate the impact of the microbiota, or the microbiome, so the whole collection of microbes that live in your gut. And in fact, there's now uh, a number of large, high-impact studies that are linking the microbes that live in your body to different diseases. So a, a big popular study that came out a, a month or two ago actually found that the microbes that you contain in your, in your gut can play a big role in whether or not you have an inflammatory response in Parkinson's disease. And so uh, one of the benefits of this article, though, is that they noted that perhaps microbiomes actually played an evolutionary role in mammal mammalian development. They believe that the microbiome gives mammals an evolutionary advantage. And they noted, um, so because you can pass down microbiome, your microbiota through breast milk or and the example they gave here, they said, in fact, that naked mole rat pups plead, plead for anal excretions from their parents, <laughs> imparting microbes that also help them thrive. Yeah, and plead for anal excretions was something that I never thought that I'd ever hear outside of my dominatrix cave, just ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Plead for anal excretions. Let's move along. <laughs> I think anal excretions is a great segue to our next study. So <laughs> a group in Britain uh, claims to have found the factors that determine whether or not women are good dancers. And they only studied women? Yes. Unfortunately, they could not find a single male in Britain who could dance well. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So a group of psychologists in England recorded the dance movements of 39 women and then recreated their actions in a... Uh, using a computer-generated simulation, which we have an image of up here on the left. Then they had a panel of nearly 200 people, both men and women, rate the dance moves of these computer-generated women, and then they rated them whether or not they thought they were good dancers. Which is basically the most boring reality TV show ever. I think it's exciting. <laughs> anyway, what they found is that, that women who move their hips and wave their arms around asymmetrically are considered good dancers. You know, like, I thought that men didn't care how well a woman dance, dances as long as she knows how to grind, <laughs> back that ass up, you know? Correct. <laughs> Correct. But these are scientists we're talking about. And to scientists, dancing is a mystery. And it's a mystery that can only be solved through statistical analysis. 
It's true. Scientists, scientists have never had a, an ass in their crotchal region. I can testify from experience. That is true. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, you know, they, the, the, con the common phrase to say is that uh, how a woman dances is how she'll be in bed, right? So does this mean that women who are good at sex move their hips a lot and, like, wave their arms asymmetrically? <laughs> is this what you want? <laughs> does, this, does this turn you on, guys? <laughs> well, I'm turned on. But I think, personally, that, like, in order to be good in bed, a woman needs to only wave one arm around asymmetrically. Disgusting. Just Disgusting, man. That's how I make love. <laughs> With your hand? <laughs> the researchers <laughs> speculate that the good dance moves serve two purposes for heterosexual women. First, it's to impress men with their reproductive prowess and perhaps even uh, signal what their ho hormonal status is. And secondly, could even um, serve a role to intimidate potential female rivals. This, of course, is according to Nick Neve, the associate professor of psychology at Northumbria University in England and the lead author of the paper. Like, maybe we just want to have fun. You know, girls just want to have fun, right? No. Or, or we're drunk, I don't know. More likely, but everybody knows you don't go to a dance club to have fun. Yeah. So um, here on the screen, you'll see a, a prime example of a very amazing female dancer. Just note, note the hip movements and the asymmetric arm movements. It's like, it's or hurt. more accurately, <laughs> my dating life. <laughs> here we go. Come right. on. Come on, internet. We're so professional, guys. Please pardon this technical interruption. <laughs> Is this not going to work? Mm. What a shame. Can we just point out uh, in the interim that this uh, man, Nick Neve, his, <laughs> his motives for why women would dance the way they do are hilarious, I think. I don't know. Is it your experience that women try to intimidate other women on the dance floor? Yeah. I'm it's intimidated. It's like a fighting dance. It's a violent, a violent act. Yeah. That's why you wave <clears> your <throat> fists around so you can hit someone <laughs> by accident. See, I think that women this. actually evolved to dance poorly so that men don't bug them in dance clubs. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. We've all, we've all been there. You stand, right, you stand in a circle and you try not to make eye contact with anyone outside the circle and still... Still, there's like that dude that like tries to like weave his way in there. I have a name, Hannah. <laughs> yes, the Matt Murthas of the world. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the yeah, next story. Sorry, then. you don't get to see the great video. That's All a right. shame. Oh. Next story, it turns out that monkeys can contract Zika virus. That's right. And more news to lose sleep over. Disease ecologist Barbara Han at the American Society for Microbiology has warned that monkeys can get the Zika virus too. The virus, which causes congenital brain abnormalities during pregnancy, appears to have been transmitted to wild primates in areas where Zika infections are prevalent among uh, humans and mosquitoes. But why is this a problem for us? Because wouldn't that mean that the baby monkeys would just have tiny heads and it would make the YouTube videos of monkeys even cuter? <laughs> Aww. Look at that baby monkey. Can their heads get any tinier and cuter? <laughs> tiny, tiny. No, the reason this is a problem, <laughs> says the scientist, <laughs> is that the animals could serve as a reservoir for future human outbreaks. If the monkeys themselves are established with Zika virus, they could actually go on to infect other humans. And as a consequence, it would be nearly impossible to rid the world of the virus. Indeed, a separate study showed that both black striped capuchin monkeys and common marmosets have been found to be infected with Zika virus. Wait. Can this be weaponized somehow so we can stop the rise of the planet of the apes from happening, Matt? You animals! <laughs> you maniacs! That's the hand I know really I love. You've done it! <laughs> it hurts. Han is so monkeys. terrified of Damn the rise monkeys. of the planet of the apes. They're um, terrifying. 
No, to answer the question, though, I think that while technically possible, it seems to be outrageously unethical. Well, I mean, the monkeys gave us AIDS, right? So we can just give them Zika. It's not a problem. <laughs> seems fair. Fair trade. Fucking yeah. apes. Okay, let's move along then. You guys, nobody wants to get little poor baby monkeys sick. So, psychologists have finally explained why it is that IKEA is a relationship death trap. Oh, uh, thanks, science. Didn't already know that before. <laughs> yeah, perhaps this isn't the most daring breakthrough. <laughs> Nevertheless, there are three main causes uh, for the phenomenon of being extremely pissed off at your partner in an IKEA. The first one is, of course, dilemma of choice. There are too many choices, and studies have shown that having too many choices is both stressful and leads to less satisfaction in your ultimate uh, selection. Hmm, the dilemma of choice. The reason why Matt is so unhappy with his sex life. Oh, wait, Matt doesn't have any choices. <laughs> Aw, that's right. <laughs> It's true. I just, it's not even a joke. It's... I take solace, though, because I can always choose between lefty and righty. I mean, <laughs> righty and lefty. No, well, twins. <laughs> Easy to confuse. Anyway. <laughs> oh, God. Homemade threesome. Second reason why fighting in Ikea can bring apart, uh, is so uncomfortable, is that it can actually bring up unrelated past grievances to the surface. Aslam Iduk, a psychologist who heads up the Relationships and Social Cognition Lab at University of California, Berkeley, he says, quote, disagreement puts people in a negative mood state. And when you're in a negative mood state, you actually remember more negative memories. Mm -hmm. This is a process called mood congruent memory recall. Ah, oh, so it's like you could be at an Ikea and an argument could go down like this. You'd be like, oh, sweetheart, um, I really like this table a lot more than the other one, I think. This one's really sturdy, really stable, very attractive. Oh, yeah, just like Mike from your office. Yeah, I saw you were looking at him at the office party. Right, yeah. like that. <laughs> Typical Ikea. Of course, now we know why all of Hannah's furniture is black. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, the third reason why uh, Ikea is such a disaster for relationships is the unclear assembly instructions. Mm -hmm. These, yeah, yeah. of course, This is to totally, totally real because um, my boyfriend, Yuis, we got a bunch of Ikea furniture and he was like trying to put it together without the instructions and then he would be like, oh, wait, how do I do this part? And I'd be like, look at the freaking directions, you idiot man. It tells you there how to do it. Just, God. <clears throat> I think perhaps maybe you and your coffee table need to see a furniture therapist. We've tried, okay, we've tried. All right. So that was Comedy News and Science, yay! Excellent. All right, with that, I would like to bring uh, up our guest for the evening. You have seen her around town. She's a singer, songwriter, former chemist, now copywriter, I believe. Please give a warm <laughs> welcome to Vanessa Hodgkinson. <laughs> Yay, Hello, thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, well, you know, as you can see from this photo, I invented the <laughs> PV selfie, PV s s plant, you know, solar plant selfies. Photo, photovoltronic? Yeah. You were Photovoltaic. The, the first person? That's what I said. But Voltron had nothing to do with it. All right, Is so that like a Pokemon, Voltron? Oh, no. my God, you are young. It's Vol Voltor. <laughs> Voltron. So. It was like a Transformer, right? No, Voltron was the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers before <laughs> they were Mighty... It was a cartoon <laughs> featuring a team of ninjas who teamed together and it jumped into their own individual robots that then assembled into a giant robot with a sword. Wow. So that wasn't a Transformer. No. It's See, not, this is like totally different. A guy thing. It's not totally an age different. thing. It's a guy yeah. thing. Mm. I don't know about All that right. shit. So Back I invented the solar plant selfie yeah. in 2011. Thank if, you very if much. If only you had a selfie stick. It would have been perfect. <laughs> well, I had someone else. <laughs> I had a minion. A minion. It's anyway. close enough. It looks great. 
So before we get into your, cool. your past studies, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where'd you grow up and et cetera? Okay, well, I was born in Washington, D.C. Heard of it? Yeah, and um, so it's not a state, <laughs> in fact, in case anybody had doubts about that. Uh, I was born stateless. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually trying to be the first refugee, the first American refugee to uh, Spain. <laughs> Just First saying. of many. <laughs> That's right. I have a movement, leading a movement here. So did you always find yourself interested in, in research and science in general? Yeah, so I really liked science. I, I, uh, and I actually got a degree in chemistry um, from a little place called Tufts University. Great school. Aw, thanks. It's got an elephant as its, uh, as its uh, mascot. And, and I really liked that because later when I went to Thailand, I thought, you know, like my totem animal was an elephant. Just saying. <laughs> so it worked, yeah, it worked together. Worked out. And then I actually, well, yeah. My re do you want me to tell you about my research So there? tell me, what did you do with this chemistry degree? Well, back then, um, uh, bio stuff I found very ooky. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, doesn't match my hypochondriac. Like, that doesn't work. I can't, I can't study diseases. But metals and chemicals, that's cool. So I really liked batteries and electrochemistry. It's cool here. You're in a safe <laughs> space. It's cool here. Yeah. I don't know if metals and chem chemicals <laughs> and metal probably mean something to very different to the general population. Chemicals. Well, yeah. Also known like as drug and rock and roll. Well, that's cool. Right. I can handle that. I apologize. But, you know, just no ooky stuff. Right. All right. So tell us about so, your research then. So in college, I studied um, electrochromic uh, thin films. As you do? Which one, yeah, so what are, what basically <laughs> you, use, uh, you, you use vapor deposition to make a thin film on a piece of glass, and then you run a current f through it. And based on the current you run through it, it turns blue or clear. So we use lithium cobalt oxide thin films. And... Uh, and uh, chemical vapor deposition chamber. So this is a way to like I tint like your windows part. if you wanted. Yeah, yeah exactly. What, what is the application of photoelectronic thin films? The idea is you use them to regulate the shading or um, heat absorption, depending on what you want, uh, for a building. So this was 1998, so it was pretty innovative back then. A little less so now. In fact, you know, now we think of... Well, we do different things with it. But sure. uh, actually, lithium cobalt oxide ended up being the perfect conductor in fuel cells. So it didn't end up going in windows at all. Huh. <laughs> so cool. there you go. Yeah. All right, Everything is useful in science. I just worked on the wrong path on that. <laughs> Wouldn't do. That's OK. So this work led you to, to working in solar energy. Well, when I finished college, I was like, well, Maybe I'm not so great at the science, you know? Like, maybe I'm not, uh, you know, pushing the envelope enough, right? I mean, you're, like, right next to Harvard and shit. And, I mean, and MIT and stuff. And, like, I don't know. There's a lot of really bright people around there. So I thought that my calling would be um, science journalism. So I actually went to journalism school. And uh, I did that. And I became a science writer for a bunch of years. But then I got tired of being behind a desk. Does that happen to you? No. no. <laughs> OK. Well. No, never been. You know, <laughs> like armchair <laughs> science. She's a translator. <laughs> well. I, I work where I want. Be like an armchair linguist mm -hmm. or something. Well, I don't know. What you I'm trying to real get. real world. So you brought along slides, though, to explain. I did. Yeah. So Thanks. Well, let's go to the next slide. I'm, I'm not yeah. really sure. OK. Well, so I really was into renewable energy. Um, this was in 2004 to 2008. And uh, I was working for a publishing company. And the cool thing about that is that I had access to a lot of reading material on all sorts of research. So I learned a little about a lot of things or a lot about a little, I don't know, something like that. So. Um, so I started to, and, and then also solar research started to get really interesting. Um, but the real key to solar power is the PN junction. Would you like me to explain that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So explain it, definitely. This. All right. 
means nothing to me this entire Okay, well, chart. the top photo is basic is the basic layers of a solar cell. And as you see, there's um, a glass cover and light comes through there and usually actually gets a little bit refracted and gets muddled. You really want glass to transmit a lot there. And that is why you have the anti-reflection coating. So that's the second level. Then you have a front contact which helps transmit Never mind, don't worry about that one. <laughs> the important bit is see where it says the negative and the positive and the junction in the middle. I have it blown up in the second photo, basically. So the negative N-type semiconductor. So these semiconductors are basically silicon glass and they are doped, drugged, you betcha. That's now it gets it. interesting. Oh, oh the, yeah. The fun stuff? So they dope them. They oh. drug them with some extra electrons. Ooh. Actually, uh, they, because silicon has four electrons. Uh, and Free electrons. Free, F-R-E. Well, free. <laughs> I was like, no, no, that's four. <laughs> A little chemistry joke for everybody. Anyway. So it, um, so if you put, so it bonds very easily to a lot of different things, and it's very stable is the point, the charge. So it has a charge usually of, well, just flat, sure. nothing. Well, let's, so, let's talk big, big picture, though. So okay, what happens Okay, well, you've here? got, right, so you've got an extra, so you dope, you put chemicals like cadmium or, I don't know, things with extra electrons, and you kind of intersperse them in the glass on one side. Then the other side, you actually dope it with chemicals that are missing an electron. So they only have three electrons in their outer shell, right? Mm -hmm. So basically the electrons that are missing, positive in this case, uh, really want that electron. And the ones that have the extra electron, it's really easy to knock them out. Like they don't want that extra electron. So when you, su when you shine the sunlight on the ones that have the extra electron, basically it shakes them loose. So you got these extra electrons and you know, it's shaking them around and then you've got the ones on the bottom and they basically start to pull towards that junction. So everybody starts to pull towards that junction. Now, sometimes people think that the contact where the you know, electricity is conducted is in the middle of the junction. It's actually not. What happens is all the negative, extra negatives, and extra positives form a wall in the junction. So they basically lock it until nothing can pass through one way or the other. So then electrons are like really desperate. And so they have to find another way to get out and get to those stupid positive holes. And they are called holes. So did you get that? Holes. So these electrons are so desperate that they see a path through the wiring, the current. See where it says current on the side over there? So they're basically looking at the circuit. That's called a circuit. Right. So I, I like this drawing, though, because to me, it really it simplifies the idea of where, how you can generate electricity through solar energy. So electricity, of course, is the flow of electrons from one place to another. Yeah. And what you have is you have the two layers, one, one positive, the other ne negative, and that creates the, what we call an electrostatic uh, potential, correct? Something yeah. like that. So they want to flow, yeah. but there's not quite enough energy for the, neg for the electrons to flow through the wire and to get to the positive end. What happens is as sunlight comes on, the energy from the photons themselves provide just enough energy to push those electrons through the wiring Sorry, the on circuit. its way, yeah. The circuit. And then once you, you have, have the, the electrons in the wiring, you have electricity, you can then store this in batteries. Yeah, I mean, incidentally, so um, yes, you do lose some electrons to this, um, oh God, I forget what the middle layer is called. It's like on the top of my head, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, we call that a recombinant loss. So essentially when you, um, 
solar cells degrade, they lost, and when they say, you know, oh, the efficiency goes down over time, over 20 years, well, the reason is because, well, one of the reasons is because of this recombinant loss. So you, they are joining up at times and making, you know, happy atoms and never to be seen again. But we, what you're focusing on is the atoms that are unhappy and really, really, really want to get to the other side and try to go through this circuit, but never make it. It's really a sad love story. It sucks to be an electron. So what, were, what was your work with, um, it was in Thailand, yeah? Yeah, so. So what were you actually doing with this, now that we know how solar cells work? So I think you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, well Data. this is, uh, yeah, this is a little more. Erotic? <laughs> Loves this is, this is what gets scientists I am the only heavy. scientist in the room, Matt. So during this time, um, you had a very few uh, kinds of solar cells. And actually, the part I really want you to focus on is this top corner. It's really small, unfortunately. But might I add that those junctions, you can create solar cells that have multiple junctions. So that produces more power. Anyway, but you have basically crystalline and thin film. So crystalline is higher in efficiency. Um, it's made out of silicon. Uh, polycrystalline, I think, takes more space. Essentially, the high, you want the higher efficiency, but the problem is, is that thin film is lower efficiency, but costs less to make, and it's, um, well, there's actually benefits in the losses. But Can I ask a question here? So what we're looking at if are different solar technologies and the yes. increase of their efficiency of the capture energy through time, right? Over time. And if you notice, so that's, like... Yeah, that's time on the bottom. And I was, yeah, I was looking at stuff from 2005 when okay. I went to Thailand, and now it's 2015. So there's so many more things right? Um, and so many more companies. And so it was sort of this revolution in solar that's happened in the last seven years, easily. Yeah, so if you look at those red lines, for instance, after 2008 or so, which is the United States economic stimulus, which uh, gave a lot of funding to solar energy. Which was a good thing, let me tell you. Sorry, Don't believe that, the shit. That'll end shit. the pol politics section of tonight's talk. Anyway, the thing to keep in mind is that you can see the increase in efficiencies for actually every type of technology. Each color is a different type of solar cell. And what you're seeing is, as we progress through time, the efficiencies increase. So you were interested in then in optimizing and increasing the efficiency for a particular type of solar cell. Well, also at that point, we really didn't know um, what uh, we really didn't know how like a tropical weather would affect the uh, efficiency of these panels. So you had these polycrystalline or or crystalline ones. I'll just lump them together for today, um, and then you had these thin films and. Um, the thing is, is that between the humidity and the heat and the temperature uh, in the tropics, which is where you have the most sunlight, uh, it reacts differently than it does in North America and everything. So, but at this point, I mean, we should get together for another, another one of these things to do the actual thin film. I was looking at the transmis transmittance um, and efficiency of these different solar cells, and actually I was looking at them in terms of color. But this uh, project lost its funding oh. at some point. So I did dig up the data, but a little late for this show today. So, um, so I wanted to talk about the other project I worked on, sure. which is more, um, slightly more on the engineering side. And uh, yeah, if you want to move on to the next slide. But I, w I will talk about that other one. So I went to Thailand, yeah, and this was uh, my lab and a bunch of my classmates and stuff. Um, I went to, uh, and they were linked with, there was the King Mongkut University of Technology, Tonburi, and it's their number one engineering school. <laughs> it's like their MIT, right? But it's so like 2000 cute. on the ranking. Yeah, really cute, right? They're really smart people. Anyhow, and, uh, and I worked with the National Science and Technology Development Agency as well in their solar lab. But again, lost its funding. So, but that's going to be a different story. So next slide. Um, instead, I decided to analyze data from a 73 megawatt solar plant. 
So, uh, yeah, so I worked for a British engineering firm to do, I was sponsored by them to do this study. Uh, anyhow, and so I thought this might be kind of interesting, yeah? How, how yeah. much is 73 megawatts? Like, what does that translate to? Uh, a megawatt can power, I think, wait a minute, no, I, I think like the, Six or seven, six megawatt output can power. Well, in Thailand, it's different because they use much less power in their homes. So we're talking 500,000 homes. Um, but so it's a lot. Yeah. So this was the biggest one in Asia built um, as of 2012. Now India has a couple more that are a bit bigger. Um, and it was using crystalline uh, panels. And I actually also tested. So what I wanted to test was how close their... Uh, predictions for power generation were. Because they were using data, but there's a lot of different stuff, and they'd never built one so big and, in the tropics. And in tropical yeah. situations. Which is about 15 degrees um, from the equator. Right, so that 55 megawatts in parentheses there, is that... That's the output. That was what was actually created. Yeah, so that's what gets plugged into So they build this the giant power plant. plant, and they say, mm -hmm. we think it's going to make 73 megawatts. And you go, ah, I don't know about that. And no, no, they know that this is what it's going to do. But they have to build it for a 73 megawatt capacity. But given the losses, so you're looking always at a 20% loss mm. from the get-go, unless you're using REC solar panels, which are su or sun power, which are super expensive and super good and will get you up to 90. Nice. But most people don't. So what did you find? Um, okay, well, this is uh, what it looks like a year before it goes online. And as you can see, it looks like a graveyard. So great. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, just uh, quick for the grid. So the cell, which is what we were designing before, uh, becomes the module, gets collected, which becomes a panel, which becomes an array, which then... Well, the panel over there gets put into a series. They get all connected, and they feed into inverters, which turn the DC current, the direct current, to AC current, which is what the power grids use and need. Um, that inverter has 87% efficiency, usually. So just so you know, that's another loss. And uh, that's all you really, and then it gets just fed into the grid and whatnot. So uh, next slide. Sorry, that was a quick overview of that. So um, how many panels does it take to build 73 megawatts? 565,000 panels. That's what they look like in crates. That's a lot of panels. Uh, part of the cost of a development project um, is they already account for 5% breakage. So when you order this number of panels, you actually order 5%, 5 to 10% more. Just because of shipping. Yeah, just because they'll break. They don't, they don't just write, like, fragile on it? <laughs> yeah, well, Fragile. then, if you fragile. get to, like... So it's I Italian. worked on this project in Myanmar, right? And uh, the, the problem was, is you get them up to the border in Thailand, but as soon as you get to the border on the other side of Myanmar, you get these horrible roads, horrible potholed roads. And so you're going to get like 10 or 15% breakage right off the bat if you want to build there. Not to mention all of you know, the gorillas that you have to pay off, literally, um, to even get right. through I the territory. I was second. thinking of paying monkeys. It's true. It's, I got real nervous. It's, it's well, <laughs> just uh, about. All right, so we only have so, another couple of minutes, though. Oh, my God. Next slide. OK, so that's what they look like. Um, security is key. One of the things in Thailand um, that makes it extra secure are these um I imagine that temples. sign there says, no dogs allowed. Was that? Yeah, so apparently it says, danger, restricted area. <laughs> Maybe it's, a, it's an engineering dog. Maybe. Uh, I don't shit. know. Very, very intellectual guard dog there. The important part, though, is the temples. So these are actually spirit temples, because um, you don't want spirits messing up your solar Plant, oh, you know, so you got to give them a place to live, and these are, you know, sanctioned, and the monks bless them and everything like that. So you know, you got to bless your, you got to bless your plants, right? Next slide. Um, of course, you need your handy alien uh, to come through. Sorry. Okay, the that's a little solar alien. joke right there. 
It is a tiny little alien that measures um, how much uh, solar power is insulation. Radiance is basically what it's measuring. So you use that to make sure that uh, your panels are being efficient and performing up to standard. So it's not really an alien. Um, it's called the pyranometer. Okay, next slide. Uh, you got to make sure that you're you have cleaning professionals. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's their water truck right over there. And that's them watering the panels because what's another loss? Dust. Dust is the enemy. Dust is the enemy. So, uh, of course, this needs to be done at least once a week. And then, next slide. So this is what it looks like in the end. Um, it is huge. That's what 500 and, well, corner of Jeez. 500... And 65,000 uh, panels look like, looks like. Is this like the normal size of a solar plant, or is this? They are now. That's what they're size doing. Size doesn't matter, Hanner. <laughs> Come on. I'm just, I'm just impressed. I don't, what can I say? OK, it's next slide. To me. Well, size I didn't queen. do uh, the next one. So I did regression analysis, basically analyzing the losses. Um, some of them, uh, initial sun exposure, did I mention that when they come out of the box, they already lose 3% efficiency? Nope. Like, all they have to do is see the sun once, and that's it. So um, snow will give you um, 8%. Well, okay, not 8% in so the summer. Just to wrap up, because yeah. we're, we're out see? of time. I'm sorry. Wow, I that's awesome. I no, thought no. I was going to be short. Oh, uh, no. I mean, you are short, but it's okay. <laughs> so you found an additional loss, uh, just reading your, your slide here, like a roughly 1% a year uh, due to the tropical conditions or... Yeah, I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing here was that um, thin films actually, their losses per year are only 0.25%, whereas polycrystalline, which the European and American countries were thinking was the better solar panel, loses a lot more per year. So even though the efficiency isn't higher, it lasts longer. And actually now, with all these new materials, like perovskite, there's a whole lot of a new school of materials that basically is uh, allowing for better transmittance, better conductivity, better, better panels. And these things are going to be, you know, these things make a difference. Every little, you know, bit sort of counts depending on the conditions. So do we have another slide? What's the next one? Did I miss it? Oh, I get to look at pretty maps. That's what they look like. Look at Spain over there. See all that red stuff? Good country. 1,900 kilowatt hours per meter squared. That's your. That's insulation. Excellent. Well, that's the one to end on. I think. All right. So with that, I think um, I would welcome questions from the audience. Yeah. Gosh, I didn't even get get to the eating crickets part. No crickets for you. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Actually, first of all, I'd like to say it was really interesting. Um, oh, well, I really appreciated your explanation. I really liked the positive, negative uh, explanation of the solar panels. I have actually two questions. Uh, the first one is, what would be your uh, input on making solar panels more uh, efficient? So you showed one graph saying, uh, starting from 2008, they kind of went up in efficiency, or 2005, I don't remember what you said. Uh, you called it like increase efficiency mm -hmm. and why you would concentrate because you talked a lot about thin films why is that because you think that film thin films could get better or which what could you make better in each uh, type of solar cells to make them more efficient and sure i have a short losses. answer for that ready yeah. okay so like i said um one of the ways to make things better is, is to make panels with multi junctions so that one like you know combination you put you stack 3 of them the only thing is is that as the sun goes through them it gets less and less but you put a reflective uh film down below so actually when the sun gets to the bottom it should reflect back up so it should make up for that that's Are one way is this already being done yeah then another way, um, for instance, uh, there's this new material called perovskite. And what it does is it, and I'm not, I, I actually, <laughs> it's more complicated for another day, but it reduces the recombinant losses. So like it, do, it prevents things from combining for very long. And I don't, I, I've read up on it. It's very, very new. The other thing is that they come up with like, you know, um, 
graphene. And graphene has been uh, uh, conductive carbon, which is very interesting because that's very low cost. Carbon is super low cost. You could literally make panels out of coal, okay. coal dust. So graphene has zero, zero resistance conductivity. So there's lots of things. And in your opinion, the, fin the thin films are the best type of solar panel to do these, uh, um, to do these improvements on? I, I do, actually. I'm a big fan of thin film. I think uh, polycrystalline is expensive. It's not going to get much cheaper. It's harder to produce. Um, if you want flexible solar cells and things, you got to go thin. And what's your view on what they're doing uh, around Sevilla? I don't know if you've seen in Spain, like, I, well, you have your map still up on the screen right now. Uh, Sevilla is almost in the very, very red part. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd have like 1,900 kilowatts per square meter. They're making very large uh, mirror towers and placing the solar panels, not like you had in Thailand, but around a, a reflective tower. So the, so the power of the sun is reflected. Uh, what's your view on this, uh, on this type of construction? Yeah, that's another technology called concentrating solar power, I think, right? Yep. Something like that. And um, I actually didn't study those so much. However, um, they are based on basically shining uh, a lot of light onto... Um, a, a heat absorbing liquid. So they basically shine all the light onto tubes with toluene or water or something like that. And um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of applications for that. It's all about reducing heat loss at that point. This is one of the improvements that you could see going farther in the next years? Um, I don't know how much that's improving. I think that's a very like mature technology, but it does work. And the improvements could go into... Um, I'm sure there's a lot of like development uh, improvements and infrastructure improvements that can lower the cost. Thanks. My second question is actually a little bit more personal. Uh, I noted that you said you studied chemistry. I which, did. Which um, is a little bit surprising for me because I always thought solar cells was more of a physics uh, domain kind of subject. And also you said that you started in 2004 and stopped in 2008. I was wondering why you stopped. Um, why you were less interested in solar panels? Well, uh, so I actually, I graduated college in 1998, and my okay, research, I was eight. yeah, <laughs> yeah, and my, and my research actually, and so actually it was very early on in a lot of these technologies. Um, I had other research projects as well. Um, I did work on uh, blood lead scanners in Singapore. Um, I've done, but the electrochemistry, I mean, at that point, you could, I could have worked for a battery company, which is probably a mistake in retrospect. But I really wanted to be a science journalist and report about these environmental and these new technologies. So I wanted to get ahead of it that. Um, I worked four years for a science publisher, so I did that. And then in 2008, basically, I decided I knew enough and I had learned enough that I would go try to do a field work and lab type of thing, which is why I went to Thailand. Thank you very much. It was really interesting, and I really liked your, your analysts and how you explained oh. everything. It was really clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those great questions, too. Um, yeah, we don't have time for any further questions. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> I think you can probably ask her after the show. Um, if we can just do it, we have a little tradition with our guests here. We like to play a little game right before we end. But we're going to have Ooh. to do it quickly. I love this one. The Go. game is called Fuck, Mary Kill. Fuck, Mary Kill. And because we're talking so much about electricity today, I'm going to have three famous uh, researchers in, in electricity, and you have to tell me which of these three you would fuck, who you would marry, and which you would kill. So we're going to have Tom Edison. You know Tommy Boy did something with a light bulb, I hear. <clears throat> kind of an ass, though. His, um, his big rival at the time, Nikola Tels Tesla, Tesla, who is arguably one of the greatest scientists ever. And, and a then, little um, loony. And then lastly, Jonah Faraday. What is Faraday? I know Faraday's constant, but what is that again? That's all you need to know. Do we know? He's well, he's constant, so I guess I would marry him. <laughs> yeah. Ah, nice. Good call, good call. Uh, <laughs> Tom Edison was a jerk. Tesla was crazy, but Tesla went crazy because Tom Edison was a jerk. So I would fuck Tesla and kill Edison. Boom. Good answer. Always fuck the crazy Good ones. Answer. Very thank nice. You. All right, with that, I'd like to th let's give a big round of applause to thank Vanessa Hodgkinson again. 
I want to thank everybody on the Technically Funny Science Talk Show crew. Christopher Drifter, DJ Charms. Thanks, My wonderful co-host, Hannah Becker. And of course, Dr. Matthew Murtha. Yes. Stick around. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll be back with some great up-and-coming comedy. Find your funny. Should be so much fun.